Okay, welcome everybody to today's eSports Research Colloquium. My name is Oliver Lies, and I'm really pleased to welcome Greg Kirvin and Simon O'Brien. And they will be discussing the Queensland University in tech of Technology Diploma in eSports. And in doing so, they will highlight how the program can help students prepare for careers in the constantly evolving environment or industry of eSports. They are also welcoming questions so if you have questions, yeah, feel free to ask them, um, raise your hand or send me a message. One reason of many why I'm really interested and eager to listen to their talk today is that I recently was listening to a recording, a presentation of Dylan Paulus at the International Federation of Esports Coaches. And in his talk, he discussed the origins of the Diploma of Esports and how he and Mike Trotter were going around the the faculty and asked all the departments for computers and equipment. And that's why I'm really interested in how the origins developed into the current program, the diploma in esports. So I'm pleased to welcome you, Greg and Simon, to illustrate how this program has developed. And without any further ado, I hand over to both of you to have your presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Oliver. Very nice to be here and thank you for inviting us. Absolutely, yeah, thank you. All right, so um, we just wanted to start with, uh, I guess, giving a little bit of an explanation of where we're situated in the university before we dive into the actual diploma itself. Um, just to give a context, so um, our course runs in QUT College um, and the college is basically set up uh, to be able to deliver diploma level courses, which um, in Australia, um, universities don't normally deliver that level course, uh, what we call an AQF5 level course. Um, universities usually uh, offer an AQF7 and above, which is a bachelor and above. Um, but the, the college was set up many, many years ago as an international college to allow students uh, who uh, came in predominantly from uh, non-English speaking countries to have a bridging course, uh, especially around English, to then move into the bachelor courses that they were interested in studying in. Um, then uh, in 2021, I believe, um, the college was converted to um, uh, uh, diploma, uh, uh, providing diploma courses for local and international students. So it then opened up a, a, a lot of pathways that were available to our domestic students. So um, the diploma, uh, the, the college is able to deliver the diploma level, which is where the diploma in esports sits, and um, it provides that pathway for students, um, particularly who are coming straight from secondary who might just need a little bit of assistance to get into university, to get underway on the course of their interest. Um, so the Diploma in Esports is, is one of many courses that we offer at the college. Um, so that's just a, a little notion and the picture that you can see there is, is our uh, student foyer where the students come in and it's a, it's a lovely fresh design in that area. So I mentioned AQF, and, and just again, uh, because this is how the Australian um, uh, qualifications are brought together, I just wanted to give everybody an understanding of how it works in Australia. Uh, we have a range of um, level courses that students can complete. Um, I've started the, the diagram there at AQF level four, which is called the certificate four. And typically that's a, a level certificate that you can attain once you've finished secondary. Um, there are some certificate threes that can't be done at the secondary level, but a lot of high schools offer a certificate one or a certificate two. Um, traditionally, the uh, certificates one through to four are offered by our uh, technical and further education or TAFE, as we call it. And then, as I said, places like QUT College that can offer a diploma level, take the diploma up from there. Um, and then you, you um, skirt up to the bachelor degree, which is the AQF level seven. Because our diploma is a full accredited course, um, students come in um, and they're able to study eight subjects, which are worth 12 points each. Um, so that totals 96 points. 
and that um, gives them their first year of a bachelor course. So when students do any of our diplomas, but in particular the diploma in um, eSports, uh, they're able to then branch into a number of bachelor areas to further their studies um, from interest. So in effect, students who study the diploma in eSports um, actually uh, assuming that they finish their studies will finish with two degrees, the diploma in eSports plus the bachelor of their choice. So um, I can, I'll can i leave that up just for a moment because we're recording the screen, people can have a read of that themselves. And if anyone is interested, it's very easy to do a search for Australian Qualifications Framework and it will give you the documentation so you can see what's involved in studying at that level. Um, I just wanted to point out again that it's um, at studying at the diploma level is fully accredited. Um, so uh, only places like um, the QT College can deliver um, a course that's a diploma level course, and it must uh, be approved by the university's academic board for it to uh, be able to be taught. Um, so um, we have to have all of our uh, curriculum, our assessment items all need to be accredited through the academic board of QUT uh, to ensure that they meet the standards of the AQF. So the Diploma in Esports itself is a full academic course. Students can study it full-time uh, in a 12-month period or part-time, and I certainly have some students who are studying in a part-time mode at the moment. Um, as I said before, uh, students who complete the course um, do so um, gaining 96 credit points towards their bachelor. And uh, most bachelors in Australia are a three-year program. So it takes that first year of study off um, the bachelor, which means that they can start in their second year. Um, the way that the diploma in eSports works is students study eight core, uh, sorry, eight um, study units over a 12-month period. Uh, that is broken into two semesters, and during those two semesters, students then study two of the core and two of the pathway electives. So at the end of the 12 months, they'll have finished their four core units in the Diploma in Esports, plus four pathway electives. Um, the Diploma in Esports has been set up to provide um, pathways into information technology, um, in, of particular interest there is um, the gaming design bachelor that, that QUT offers, uh, where students look at game design. Um, there's also an AI bachelor. They can uh, take a pathway into creative industries, which lets them look at um, anything to do with film and television, music, etc. And then they can also choose to go into uh, the business pathway, which is uh, what Simon did while he was studying. So he's now studying his bachelor in business. Yeah, absolutely. So within the Diploma in Esports itself, um, you'll see there that our, uh, again, just uh, further information there, a regular bachelor is three years full-time. The Diploma in Esports pathway is one year full-time. Um, and then that takes you into your second or third year of bachelor. Okay. So, we cover four core units um, in the Diploma in Esports. And this is, this is where we start getting into the nitty gritty of what the course does. Um, and I think it's really important to make mention at this point that um, the Diploma course is not about gaming, as in how to become a gamer. So we established that really quickly in the course to ensure that the students coming into our course know that this is actually about esports in the whole. And while gaming plays an important part of the esports arena, um, we've got these other four areas that are the key to the study. Um, so you can see on the screen there, we look at four subjects uh, or units. We have ESD001, which is the esports ecosystem. And that's uh, an opportunity for students to actually deep dive into the whole world of esports. Um, and I'll come back to that one. Uh, the ESD002 is gaming culture, where we take a, a trip down um, memory lane and learn about how games of the good old years have brought us to where we are now. Uh, 003 is esports consumerism, where the students learn about um, how marketing and consumerism in esports 
uh, is effective and how we can make use of that, particularly from the financial aspect. And then we wrap up the year with the contemporary concepts in esports, which more or less looks at the rest of the esports industry. Um, so in there, we, we have a look at um, individual gamers. What do you look like and how do you come across? What's your persona like? Um, working with others. Um, while again, we don't teach, uh, we don't have a unit on teaching coaching. We look at aspects of coaching. Um, so all four units have been designed so that a student uh, completing the course has an all round uh, aspect of the esports industry. So when the course was originally designed, that was how it was to be tailored as a course that could um, provide anybody studying it with an opportunity to understand the esports world. Um, so yes, there is gaming in there, but we don't uh, we don't have students who come in and we have a Rocket League class today where we teach Rocket League skills. Um, students who are wanting to do that can join another program at our university. Simon, did you want um, I think some comments there? The biggest takeaway having gone now through the diploma is the kind of following on with what Craig's saying, it is very much that look at industry, that kind of top-down view, and you get, I guess, tasters of all different, I guess, roles that would be applicable to esports. So in 004, you're looking at what a coach's role might be, what a nutritionist role might be. In 003, consumerism, you're creating marketing plans. So it's really that touchstone to, I guess, get you familiar with what is applicable to esports as a career um, and to experience all of it. And I thought that was, yeah, a great takeaway when I went through the diploma myself. Awesome. What will help to really paint the picture is if we just take a couple of moments to talk through what each of the four units covers, um, just in a brief nutshell. Um, and the, the easy way for us to show that is by um, looking at the fact that we deliver three modules. So each of our units, we teach three modules. Um, the modules tend to be a four-week module, a five-week module, followed by a four-week module. Um, and that has allowed me to develop um, content that's, that's quite specific for the section of that unit that we're wanting to deliver. So in es uh, uh, sorry, eSports Ecosystems, you can see there we cover um, a module called What Are eSports, which is obviously specifically about addressing what are eSports. I've used that module, um, th uh, that module has grown uh, since uh, Michael Trotter uh, originally developed this unit. Um, I was mentioning to you before, Oliver, that um, I started a little bit after the diploma last year had commenced, um, and now I work there full time and I've been responsible for uh, renewing the, uh, the course. Um, so, uh, with having such a huge intake this year of 23 students, the predominant age of those students is straight out of high school. So for us, that's around that 18 to, to 19 year old. So of those 23, in, a, in my last survey that I did with the students, um, of the 23 students, 20 of them are between, actually there's three of them who are 17. So between the age of 17 and 19. So they've all just come out of, um, school. Uh, the other three have been out of school for between two and three years and have maybe stopped started their study. Why I'm um, honing in on that is because most students of, of that age, and we sort of found this last year, yes, mm. Simon was a student, but he's a little older. Um, but uh, the other guys who were in the course last year were also mostly fresh out of school. So they come in with this belief that when you say, well, what's eSports, that eSports is playing a game. So we spend this time in module one really ensuring that they understand that, yes, it's a game, but it's also this other stuff said loosely. Um, and that's really important. And by the end of those four weeks, I find then that they're able to talk uh, or converse um, more broadly than just, well, as a Rocket League player, they're starting to then take on the language after the first four weeks of, so now we're in this industry, 
Now we're talking about the industry. So that's the whole intention of that first module. And what we get them to do in that module is um, the assessment task is to create an, an inter sorry an interactive infographic um, where it gives them an opportunity to take an area that maybe they haven't thought about before and look at what makes that so interesting to them and then create an infographic on it. When Simon's cohort went through last year, um, they had to do a presentation rather than inter an, an interactive infographic. Um, first assignment through, Simon was okay, but the others? <laughs> yeah, it was interesting. You could tell that they were very much straight out of high school mm. um, in the best way, but they obviously hadn't had that experience presenting to audiences much. As much, past. yeah. Um, so we had a lot of nerves. We had a lot of, um, you know, people were quite shy. I mean, we're talking about an assessment task in the first four weeks of, of starting uni. So I able to get the academic board uh, to agree to changing that one to being an interactive. And my purpose of that was, um, you know, just to extend what an infographic can do rather than just having everybody hand me in a PowerPoint or a Canvas or a Canva or whatever, you know, they might choose. Now they have to actually really think about it, make it um, talk, make it, um, uh, you know, the, the, it was important where your data was laid out so that uh, when you went through the presentation, it made a lot of sense. Um, the module that we're currently halfway through is the actual development of the esports industry itself. So this is where we, we're looking at things like um, primary and secondary stakeholders. Um, what are the significance? How do they interweave with each other? Uh, we did an interesting activity uh, last week or the, over the last two weeks where, uh, first of all, they did, uh, the students themselves did a vote on what they thought were um, the predominant stakeholders so that they could create their own list of primary stakeholders. I then... Um, flashed their results up against a, a recent um, study that had been completed in the States. They were fairly close in what they had observed. I think we had one that was out. Um, then we did the same with the secondary stakeholders. Um, but what I got them to also do was to, to web that out and plan it out and have a look at actually, you know, this, there's an incredible web of information in here when you see how the stakeholders come together. The significance of that, if you recall from your days of doing the assign uh, the uh, that module, yep. is about the comparison with traditional sports because we're still seeing around the, the world where there's an argument about whether esports is part of traditional sport. So um, you were involved in writing your analytical essay, Simon. Yeah, so we really kind of got to deep dive and kind of do uh, produce an analytical essay. But the research component of that was really interesting. Being able to go into you know different studies that were done and make those comparisons between esports as a comparison to traditional sports um, in terms of benefits, risks. Um, it's been a while now, so I can't exactly <laughs> remember what I talked about. But I remember being spending a lot of time on that study of the research, and mm -hmm. there was a lot of a lot of really rich material out there to kind of look into. I think a really important thing and uh, uh, to mention here is that um, the students aren't just asked to do a compare, uh, sorry, to do an analytical essay of esports and traditional sports. There's a caveat in there mm -hmm. that you then have to look at another area tied into that um i think from memory actually you're right i'm starting to go on, but you had a lot about gender and yeah. equity and school i think i did focus mining on school kind of using my background mm. as a high school teacher mm. to to really look at the benefits for students and school-aged sort of participants in esports mm. So the students have got this opportunity to extend it. So we're not just looking for them to write an analytical essay that says, oh, this is sport, this is e-sport, and they look a bit alike, they don't look alike. Um, they actually have to deep dive. What I've encouraged the students to do this year is to actually um, use one of the stakeholders as a focus um, and then start being able to have a look. So well, what do broadcasters look like in the sports industry versus what does that look like in the e-sports industry? Um, and why might one have a different look or feel to what the other one is. Our third module then has a look at pathways. Um, so this ties in with their overall study, 
Um, so what the students will be doing in, in that part of um, the world will be actually looking at what jobs are out there and then um, have opportunity to think about what it would be like to work in their particular um, field of interest. And they're going to make an infomercial that demonstrates their understanding of that pathway, their interest in it, and uh, why they would want to sell that up to someone else. Um, and that actually came about because for our course, if you have a look on the QUT website, we have a little infomercial on there about the diploma in esports. And we thought, well, what a great way to be able to see how students have pulled their information together, but to get them to do an infomercial. We're obviously not assessing them on um, their film and television creativity, but more so how they're bringing their information together. So the end result may be rough and ready, um, but it's the concept that we're looking for in that assessment task. And again, we've tried to ensure that those assessment tasks are quite real world. Um, I say that a little bit sparingly on an analytical essay, but then we also understand that in the diploma level, we have to train the students how to write analytical essays for further up in their bachelor studies. So some of it's got to be a little bit more in that sort of realm. We then move into, I should actually say that at the same time, um, 002 is occurring. So sorry, Oliver, you had a question. May I step in here? Um, can you get yes. back one slide? Um, yes. I I've, I've believe that the module on eSports ecosystem does a great job on setting the stage for the the students and i wonder if i can raise a question to to simon of if you can recall mm. the most valuable skills or pieces of knowledge that you gained from those three modules even though they changed um, based on what great yeah, just yeah, said um, i think as a whole what was really valuable as a student but also as kind of a more of a mature student in that scene was that there was that built-in ability for scope in the assessments that we produced. Um, so we were really able to run with whatever points of interests we had. Um, so as we were talking about with that particular um, analytical essay that I produced, I was able to look and use my background um, as a teacher to be able to really focus in on the benefits for students. So I thought that was really beneficial to be able to tailor what it was that I was doing um, and I think as far as skills that I was able to get from that that were really important and valuable uh, in general but also in terms of career was the idea of I guess really being able to reach out forge connections within the ecosystem itself mm -hmm. both in a local context and an international context um, forge those relationships with people get talking to other people learn from other people mm -hmm. and it was something that I think you did really well, Craig, at building into the way that you delivered the course in really making sure that the students, and myself included, took on that responsibility of trying to reach out and trying to mm. trying to get our names out there, but also to learn from others. Mm. Um, so I think that was really valuable as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as we just touched on reaching out, um, I have one more question before we can move on to the uh, second U core unit. Um, Greg, you said that students have to present something. And I wonder, this is just my curiosity, if this is an aim of the Ooh, overall diploma that students should learn how to speak in front of uh, audiences so, and communicate um, research. Yeah. I, I think I'm lagging, maybe. Should I repeat the question? Sorry, Oliver, I think we're losing you. Can you hear me now? Hello? Is it better now? That's better. That's better. Ah, okay. I'm I'm sorry we about dropped, that. We dropped there for a minute. Okay, I'm sorry. I don't know what's wrong with my internet, or yeah, let's let's try again. So you can no, hear me. Don't know if it's good. Don't know okay. If it's good. okay. My my question was, or did you get the question? No. So my question was. You 
Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. So I, I repeat my question. I'm sorry. So um, since we, we addressed reaching out and, and Greg, you said that it is that students have to present something in this module. My curiosity was um, that I wonder if, if this is an aim of the overall a diploma that students should learn how to communicate their ideas in front of the public or the a brighter audience. Yes, so um, we have a number of overarching um, criteria that have to be considered when we develop units. So there is one in there for communication, but I have flexibility in what gets delivered and how it gets delivered. So for that one, that's now taken um, preference in unit four because it's in the second half of the year. Um, once and, and it's so that the students don't uh, necessarily feel anxious in that first part of the year. Um, and I, I'm very, I'm actually really glad that I've made the decision to do that um, in week six, just before the holidays. I actually could see where the students have started to relax and realise we're at university now and it's even taken those first five weeks to stop a hand going up and calling me Mr and, you know, because that's what they're used to from high school. Um, so by moving that overarching communication criteria to the second half of the year, um, when we talk about... Um, uh, ESD 004, I'll make mention of how that's been brought in as one of the assessment items in there so that there is a proper and true uh, uh, assessing of their um, their communication ability. Thank you. Thank you for this insight. Um, now you can move on to the um, next move on. Or unit. No problem. Gaming culture, I think. Yeah. Ha. So gaming culture, this one's, this one's really exciting. I, I they're all exciting units, but this one, um, everybody likes this unit in particular. Um, and that's because the module one, as you can see there, is the history of gaming. So the first four weeks, uh, well, I get super excited about this, is that um, I, I uh, get a chance to go back to my childhood years and we have a look at where games started. Um, and it's really interesting, again, you know, the students think that they've got this plethora of, of knowledge and yes, 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 you know, everything started with Zelda. Yeah, actually, it was a little bit before Zelda. Um, oh, yes, 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 you know, it, it must have started with Pac-Man. Well, actually, there's a few years before Pac-Man, before we even get really started. Um, so then we discover Space War, um, the actual, well, Space War and Pong. Um, so what I did this year for this unit to make it even more interesting was that during this four weeks, um, uh, even though it was an, a non-assessed, um, it was still part of learning, the students had a weekly um, arcade challenge. And they, there were two games chosen. So we went up by the, um, by the decade. So we started with 1960 and actually found an online emulator for Space Wars. Um, and also found an emulator for, for Pong and they had to jump in and they they uh, were encouraged to play and put up their, we used Padlet to put up their um, results and see how they were looking. We've also, funnily enough, uh, just down the road in, in um, Brunswick Street in the Valley, uh, we, we have an establishment there um, called Nether, Nether World uh, where you can go and have a nice, beer and a, a, a um, pub meal, but they have every known game historically yeah. um, around in all of their little rooms. So while you're enjoying your your burger and your um, and your beer, you can play games. So I encouraged anyone who was above 18 or above 17, I should say, to maybe go down and spend some time there and have a look at some games. Um, and uh, and also some of them were, um, were telling me that they've got you know that you can you've got uh, various copies of these games are available on the switch and all these sorts of things but uh, we spent the four weeks looking at the significance of these games and delving into um 
you know, well, well, how did we suddenly get to first person shooter? Where, what game did that come from? Where did where did we start with that? And how did that culture, um, you know, start appearing? And then um, what about, uh, you know, a lot of the students in the class are, um, they're actually, this group's interesting. They're not so much Rocket League fans as we've had in the past, but this lot are more uh, Overwatch or, um, uh, what else we got? We got a lot of Zeldas in there, um, Fortnite players. You know, so again, it was about, well, that's great. They're the games you play now today. How did we get to that game from those games there? So they had to do a little bit of research in, and uh, look at this historical development of games uh, from a different, a, a few different prongs. And this then formed their case study. So they, they looked at the game historically. Um, so where might a particular, you know, where has CSGO come from? So then they could start discovering, well, if you go back, we, we can see that there's Wolfenstein um, in the 90s. If we go back from there, we can see Game X. We go back from there. Um, there's a whole heap of mechanics that look very similar as you're starting to go through, but they narrow down more specifically as we get to the games that they play today. But on that journey, we also took the time to have a look at, um, you know, you guys all, uh, they, they sit down at their... 140 hertz minimum screens and play these wonderful QLED games with, with uh, super sense around sounds and effects and all this sort of thing. But, you know, let's have a look at what they were like when, when your game ideas were developing, but also what did they look like as they were coming along? Um, I think they really actually, the students really enjoyed it. I remember them really uh, telling me how much they really enjoyed it, but I think they were in shock a little bit because I don't think they'd actually realised or taken the time to delve into what these earlier games looked like. So to actually see a game, well, we started with um, with a Game Boy in 2-bit graphics um, and then had a look at it going up to 8-bit graphics. We um, did a comparison of 8-bit sound to 16-bit to 64 to 128 um, bit sound, etc., um, and uh, you know they were obviously they were listening to the differences. Um, class activities included um, things like um, can, how about how about um, uh, let's let design a um, uh, a fortress type game or a Zelda type game, and I'm going to give you a Game Boy template, and we're then talking about designing for this big. Um, and they couldn't get over that concept because all of their games are, you know, minimum 1080p. Um, so how do you design for something that's this little? I also threw in an, an optional um, extra for them. Again, it was non-assessed, but for anybody who was interested, not, not in diving right into coding, et cetera, but if they were interested in just finding out about the mechanics of a game, what do we need to know? How does a character move? How does that affect things from this type of game to this type of game to this type of game? Um, you're welcome to hang around and we'll go through that. Well, I, out of the 23 students, I had 20 of them stay. Um, and we had just a very, this is this year's cohort. We had a very elementary look at um, a game engine called Godot, um, which is a really, really nice uh, engine. Um, and certainly a very easy step in uh, for anyone who's wanting to get into game design and, and eventually go Unix, um, sorry, not Unix, um, Unity or Unreal 5. Um, and because the cohort, I, I mentioned before, that our cohort this year is, is you know, um, predominantly 17 to 19 year olds. Interestingly enough, for the take up in the different pathways, the predominant pathway is Bachelor of IT or Bachelor of Gaming. So I don't think it was any surprise then when I offered that, that I had so many wanting to stay. And now I've still got them saying, can we have a lunchtime club or something? High school talk. Um, can we have a lunchtime club so we can sit and, and learn from each other and how to keep developing games? Um, so that was that was a really interesting and exciting change in the unit for me than what, because Simon's group didn't have that. Um, but then we moved into module two, which was about gaming cultures. And in this one, the, the um, assessment item is called a reflective journal. 
So the reflective journal involves the students responding to the five topics that I cover over the five weeks of the gaming cultures. So um, topics include things like, um, well, what is gaming culture? When we're talking about it, what is it? And how do you identify? So um, we used a study that had been completed in the States by a, a group of um, professionals who were trying to work out, is there any way that we can actually ascertain what type of gamer you are? Um, I took their, their mechanism and I made my own, uh, just emulated it exactly the same. We got the results in and we actually had a look at how we compared to a, a thousand students in the States who had completed this particular um, study and my 23. And it was very interesting to see that our um, we were, were within a hair's breadth of each of the nine areas that the study completed as to how we saw ourselves as gamers, what we believed the gaming industry was, et cetera. Another topic that we have a look at in this unit, in this module, <clears throat> excuse me, is um, they, uh, one of, one of the things that, again, I've noticed with the younger students coming through is that they haven't actually taken the time to think about um, not just what kind of gamer am I, who am I as a gamer? Um, yeah, you know, they, they have a Discord name, but they haven't thought about how do they brand that name? How do they brand themselves in a game? They just go on and they make up a name that suits them today. So I spent um, a, a session looking at what makes up your gamer identity um, and when, you know, how long is a piece of string as to how much time I spent on it. Um, but we had a look at things like um, generating a 3D avatar. If we were in the 3D um, AR world, what would you look like? Um, but we also, at the same time, I, I had a look at a study that shows about um, the dangers that some um, younger students face in hiding behind um a persona of such, um, but we looked at you know how do you create a hash a hashtag? Um, how do you then ensure that you've branded yourself across all your social media? What if you were a professional player? What would your dress look like? Um, are you sponsored? Uh, how do you create a pair of sponsored shoes? Um, we also have a look at what it means then when you get when you're a Fortnite um, player and then you've uh, you're an influencer and you you reach your million mark, what does it mean when Fortnite gives you a phone call and says, right, we're going to make a skin for you? What does that look like? Are you going to be one, you know, somebody who has a skin? Um, so we had a look at a, a fellow by the name of Lachlan Power, um, who is a, a local here in Brisbane. Uh, my sons went to school with him um, and had a look at how he hit the million mark and then what happened. <laughs> but it also gave the students to have a look at what it's like um, then from the point of view that Lachlan was a professional player and is now a professional influencer. So here we've got a change in job description. So everything comes together. Um, so all of the things that we do on the Reflective Journal all work in that same sense. Another example is toxicity. So that one's going to be, uh, well, sorry, hand in hand with that is what do you like as a gamer? So they have to do a, a, a monitor themselves over a week. How much play do you have? What do you play? What time do you do it? Um, so they can then work out uh, what they look like as a gamer. So when, when your mum and dad say, my son or my daughter is a gamer, what do they mean? But then in addition to that, they're going to have a look at toxicity. And... Um, be aware of their own toxicity. Um, because again, what I what I found, and even found with the guys in your group, mm. Simon, is they're often not aware that they are central to the toxicity. Um, then the last part, the last module, we move into after sort of having a look at all of that history, what game you're interested in, what game you're going to play, um, what's the culture, how do you work together, how's your game play, what's somebody else's gameplay like, we've been listening to each other. Okay, the last module now is, right, how do you now create a winning team? What, what's the cultural aspect of doing that? Um, 
And the decision I've made there, um, and the, the students don't know this yet, but they'll form a team, uh, as in a, a study team, where, that will work on this together. But to make it even more realistic, they're going to then be uh, ra or a, a random, it'll be randomised as to what game their team will play. And that will then allow that research to occur. So they should be able to bring all of that knowledge of the unit together and then be able to go, okay, so we've got a Counter-Strike team. What have we got to do? How are we going to pull this together? What will it look like? <clears throat> Part of that um, winning team is also looking at what your rig will be like. Um, and we've got a really switched on local um, computer company who has... Um, made themselves available to come in and they're going to bring in um, one of our local teams, the Chiefs. They're going to bring in one of the Chiefs' actual gaming rigs for the students to see so they can get an understanding of this is a gaming rig. Yes, you've got a good computer at home, but this is a gaming rig. Um, and what do you need to, to make it operate, et cetera? So... Gaming culture, which is a bit different to what you yeah, studied. Absolutely. So this is probably the unit that I've had a little bit of conversation with Craig about how it's changed and even just now. The changes are quite, quite dr not dramatic, but quite drastic compared to a lot of the other units um, from my time last year completing them. But what really stood out to me then when you were explaining it, that stayed the same, that was probably my biggest takeaway from doing gaming culture, was that idea of revealing insights to yourself about culture if you stop and take five minutes to think about it it's not a big or complex topic to get your head around but the thing is no one really takes that five minutes mm -hmm. to stop and think so in module two with those reflective journals um, back when I did it and by the sounds of it it's very similar this year uh, what was really purposeful and valuable about those was sitting down and creating statements about yourself at the start and then as you go through that study and as you start really unpacking the layers to how this culture is being brought about, both um, in a cultural level, but also your own individual culture, your initial statements start to either hold true or unravel themselves. And I guess analysing that about yourself would be really interesting when I did it last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the other uh, change that's been made is uh, in that module three is the post presentation. And I apologize. I had in my head that it was in unit four. Um, the post presentation uh, goes back, Oliver, to what you were talking about before with this is the communication part. Um, so what we're actually hoping is that we'll be able to get industry representatives to come in um, for that post presentation um, and the intention there is that it will literally be the students will produce posters uh, and they'll have stand around um, stations that people can go to, look at the poster, but also interact with the students to talk to them about their team and what they discovered. <clears throat> I, I really like how you combine theoretical input with hand-on tasks. So students get to meet teams, get to test something by themselves and doing reflective journals. I, I really like that. Um, would love to be a student, but Thank you. time has passed. Yeah. Um, maybe you will talk about this later, then just ignore the question, but how are those modules, for example, what we just talked about, the gaming culture and the other um, was about the ecosystem. How are those modules uh, disseminated or structured in the one-year course? But it was one year if you do it full time, right? Do you, do you understand so the question? Those, yeah. the, the two, I, I think I have. The, those two units uh, run simultaneously. So in a student's week, they will attend. Uh, so the way that the, the any, any of our diplomas is structured is a student um, participates in a unit that's made up of um, a workshop of a specified amount of time, which is the lecture. Uh, and then tutorial, which is a specified amount of time. In the case of the, the four core units, uh, we do 90 and 90, so a total of three hours. And the difference from when Simon went through is that Simon's two units, as he was in, the workshop and the tutorial were on different days. 
There's some advantages to that, but there are lots of disadvantages. I've been fortunate this time around that they're back to back. So Wednesday morning, all my students come in for the ecosystem and they come for three hours. Then on Thursday morning, they come back in again and they have the gaming culture. So that's what I mean by simultaneous. But the, the advantage of that as well is that while, and Simon will attest to this, I certainly am, I'm a, an instructor who teaches to the full amount of time. So if, if I have 90 minutes to teach you, you'll, you'll be in that lecture or workshop for 90 minutes and then the, the tutorial will be 90 minutes. It is rare that I go under that time. And there's a couple of reasons for that. And that's because I believe wholeheartedly that the amount of time we've got together is not long. So there, and there's a lot to be worked through. In addition to that, the, the reason that there's a lot to work through is that students pay are paying for their education. So to me, they have to get value for the amount that they're paying for their course. So if a, if a student comes in and, you know, me as their lecturer says, ah, well, yeah, we're only going for an hour today, that says to the student, well, I'm only giving you 66% of what you paid today. Uh, and I just have a, a real issue with that. So I do, I am known as teaching to, to the uh, number of minutes. Um, the disadvantage I was talking about before with Simon's group was because it was split. Um, the advantage of that is that you've got an opportunity for things to sink in because typically the workshop is the workshop is a theory and the tutorial is hands-on. That's sort of how it works. But what would happen, especially before I came on full time, is Simon's class would get a tutorial on a Friday afternoon at 5 p.m. And I'd be lucky out of the seven students if I got two. Um, whereas with them back to back and in the morning, and surprisingly, I've been surprised because 17, 18 and 19 year olds at nine o'clock in the morning do not go together, but I actually get all 23 and I've got them for three hours. So there's not sort of, you know, there's been one or two have said, I've got to leave early today for whatever reason, which I respect, but that did make life a bit difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. But mornings and back to back does sound mornings a lot back to back sure. better. Yeah, yeah. All so right. For one question from my understanding, though they don't have to attend the courses to pass the course. So is it um, as a as an educator, Oliver, I will say it's it can be a frustration. Um when I went to university, which is back with the dinosaurs, um, there was a component of study that was um, an attendance component. But I can see that I can see it both ways. I can see that that's like a big stick. And so my belief is that students should want to be in your lecture because it's worth coming. So when I plan my units, I make sure they're worth coming um, to. The other thing that I do is um, the, the setup. Uh, unfortunately, there's not everything that we can show you in this, first of all, in a short session today, but also we're bound by um, intellectual property. So we can't actually show inner workings of our course. Um, but our courses are uh, set up in Canvas. I'm sure you're familiar with Canvas. Um, and I'm sure you, you have your courses set up in a similar way where uh, a student can come in, so Simon can come in and he can see uh, it's module one, week two. And in there, there'll be some notes, of, uh, you know, some dot points about what we're going to cover so that as an adult, he can make that decision, am I going into the lecture today? Uh, and then the way I have mine set up is that you can get my uh, PowerPoints. They're available for download as a PDF. Uh, that's for both the workshop and the tutorial. And then we also have one other that we're required to do, which is called e-content. And the e-content is an extension of what we're covering in the workshop and the tutorial. But 
when I do, when I prepare a, a PowerPoint, they're not actually dissimilar to what I've had on the screen for this session today in that I will have some sort of graphic, but generally speaking, the words that are on the screen are minimal. And I do that intentionally, as Simon's group found out when I took over last year, um, because one, I've never been a believer in uh, having a PowerPoint that's got every single word in it that you're going to say, because if I go and attend somebody's workshop like that, then I may as well, I don't, I could have saved myself an hour because um, I can read that. Whereas I get a gist. So as Simon, if Simon is still my student now, he can see this screen in front of you now and go, oh, okay, we're going to talk about those three things. Craig hasn't given the full kit and caboodle away. He's given me enough to go, I need to be there for that. Um, and, he, and so Simon can have a look through all the slides and go, oh, yes, no, I can't miss out on this today. Um, and what I found happened with the group that I had last year and then with this year's cohort is that they know that the only way they're going to get everything that I'm going to present to you is to come in and listen and take notes. So I've taken that approach with it because I do uh, worry about making sure that students attend. But like I said earlier, I, I have that notion of that if they're not attending, it's on me, that I'm not presenting it in enough uh, fashion that they want to be there. So I need to look at how I teach and deliver. Yeah, I, I agree. We should always make sure that courses are valuable. And I highly believe that you do. Um, but I was just curious given that I might be yeah. a dinosaur too. I had to attend. But now, <laughs> as a lecturer, I I have students that don't need to attend. And that's why I was curious how it's uh, in your country and the diploma. Thank you. So let's let's uh, talk no, consumerism. OK, so esports consumerism. Um, so basically, this unit is, is all about consumerism, but it uh, takes the esports flavor. Now, this one is uh, actually run by um, uh, a colleague of ours who has a business background. Um, I, with Simon's group last year, I uh, was the tutor for this one. So I, I stopped being a lecturer in this case and, and uh, worked with the gang um, as a tutor. And Katrina took the course um, because of her knowledge in this area. But basically, as you can see there, there's a lot of analysis and looking at how consumerism works in esports. Um, so uh, essentially, well, actually, do you, it's pretty fresh for you. So, yeah. yeah um, would you like to talk about this one? Sure. I've done a lot of talking. <laughs> um, so 003 was a really interesting one. And I think more so because when I was a student doing the esports diploma, I chose the marketing bachelor as the pathway that I've been moving into. Mm. So a lot of what was talked about in consumerism, a lot of the topics and a lot of the theories were topics and theories that we had already done in the other half of our diploma, which was the marketing subjects and the marketing courses. Um, what was really good about esports consumerism is it takes a very holistic approach to looking at what a marketer might do as far as esports is concerned, um, how they may create a sponsor pitch to take to a brand and how they can get their brand into the esports industry, um, looking at different ways to get them involved, different marketing strategies, how to look at a marketing mix, how to look at demographics um, the, and strategies to target these demographics, I guess, to really help that brand get in. Um, and it kind of all capped off with one big assessment piece, which is the marketing plan, which looks very similar to what you've got yeah, coming this same. year, um, which was really good because we got to choose either an endemic or a non-endemic sponsor. And as a group, create this marketing plan document to be able to provide for them mm -hmm. um, and use in a really, I guess, realistic and tangible way. Um, that's kind of my recollection. No, that's, that's if you really wanted good. to talk over the modules. No, and but um, you did forget that one strategy that was my favourite oh, that no. we looked at. What did I forget? The theory of planned behaviour. So um, it, it's always good when we can bring theories in. Um, and uh, Katrina, who runs this unit, had brought that theory in, but we then extended it in both in this and ESD004, yeah. and really had a good look at how the theory of planned behaviour works in esports. 
So that was that was kind of very interesting to do that at the time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the endemic that we did was uh, Gatorade. Gatorade. And the non-endemic was Lego. Um, and we, I'm not one for you know repeating content anyway. But we can't use uh, we can't use Lego again this year because Lego actually now has a range of esports kits. Um, they, they've now got a, a gamer track that yeah. uh, we discovered. So uh, I think we, the last we talked, although it could be interesting, we have a, a it's it's not a um, a brand as such, uh, but we have a, a a shopping outlet in Australia that's called Culture King, um, and so we were sort of talking. Uh, it it's one that you would think was an endemic sponsor, but it's actually a non-endemic. Um, and we were thinking about having a look at that. And because it's local, it, it actually originated in Brisbane, there's opportunity where our students might be able to speak to the owners. The only reason I'm saying it the way I am is because I happened to read in the paper, I think on the weekend, um, that they've gone into administration. So we may need to have a, a look at another outlet or uh, something, but the reason we were looking at them is because we saw it as opportunity. You know, one of the conversations we've had while while we've been just rethinking the course is, um, you know, if you if you are uh, when you're looking for your identity in 002, um, you know, I spoke to the students about this the other day. Um, do you all wear jerseys? Do you wear a jersey of your favorite player or your favorite team? And as they identified, the only place to buy jerseys and gear is online through the online stores. They want to be able to walk into a store and pick it up. So they all like, I don't know if you have it uh, where you are, Oliver, but we have, um, I think it's a Chinese store called Uniqlo. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's again, it's uh, Uniqlo. Um, they upmarket um, like Sesame Street clothing, Nintendo brand. clothing brand, you know, some brands like that. Yeah. They? Um, and they went, the, the students have said, oh, we wear jerseys if you could walk into Uniqlo and find the jerseys hanging on the shelf. Um, so that's where the esports market hasn't, well, in Australia, hasn't gone yet. Um, so that's, I know Katrina sort of having a look at uh, how she can capture that a bit more and get the students thinking about the marketing side of it. Um, but no, I think you pretty much, Hit the nail on the head with that unit. Um, it was, yeah, definitely yeah. an interesting unit, um, especially having that marketing sort of interest, but mm, being that bachelor, mm. really, really interesting to be able to look holistically at brands, but also look at the industry and see how you can mesh the two. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. ESD004. So this one then rounds it off. Once we get to this one, we know we're at the home straight. Um, again, three and four are run um, simultaneously. So whatever that looks like next semester, um, for whether it's a Wednesday, Thursday thing, again, we'll see. So module one uh, is health and well-being. Health and well-being. Um, so this module is the same as the one that Simon did last year, except that um, the assessment task has been slightly changed. Um, so what we found last year was Simon, so the assessment task is about looking at your well-being as a player. So they have to go back in and monitor their fitness, um, uh, their sleep patterns, their gaming patterns. So even though they've done some gaming patterns in unit two, we come back, we've now had a look at using that or we, you know, we've become used to collecting data. Um, so they come back in, they collect that sort of data again, um, their nutritional data. Simon's group uh, was given a mechanism for uh, collecting it yep. and only recorded it for two weeks. That was yeah, the original exactly. assessment task. What we discovered when we looked at that, though, was that that was insufficient time. So this is a four-week unit. Uh, sorry, yes, a four-week module and then a four-week assignment but this time, um, we're probably, there's still opportunity where we where we may do it like we did with Simon's group and give them the mechanism. But uh, 
we were also contemplating whether it was better if the students develop what they're collecting it in. So they develop their own Excel spreadsheet to collect the data or some mechanism to collect the data, but the, the collection and the analysis of the data will be from a four week point of view, not a two week point of view, because that can just give a bit more. It's still an individual task. So that we found was an important factor for this task last year. Um, in Simon's group because at this stage um, the students were starting to realise that what they what they looked like as a gamer, as a person in the esports industry was now less, um, I guess, less private in, is a way of putting it. Yeah. And so we were concerned. We wanted to make sure that they also understood that, that um, you know, the data that they were looking at was their data and, and it was shared between me and them, but me as their lecturer, not me in uh, analysing their data. So um, it was a, a self-oriented mm -hmm. analysis of their data and that seemed to be really important to the students that that was, um, was part of the deal. Um, even though it's it, it does have that psychological part where um, if a student was to go off and be working with other uh, players, they would have to be sharing data, but that's okay. It's a it's a uni assignment, so we'll go with the flow on that one. Um, in unit two, we're actually having a look at some aspects of coaching and training, um, and again, we're just sort of training carefully there because we're not pro, um, professing to be um, esports coaches and trainers, but we want them to have had um, uh, an idea of what it is like to work with someone else. So in this instance, what they're um, more going to look at doing is creating a training plan. And we have some industry contact there in that um, we've got a local um, establishment called Team Bliss, or they, they're a local team, uh, who run training sessions in camps who are willing to take some of our students on um, in, in a um, work experience manner. Um, we also have a number of schools. Um, schools are always reaching out for how um, we can be supporting to them because they don't have the, the resources themselves. So we'll be able to um, tap into that and have a look at our guys being able to go out and work with people in schools. Um, one of the really important aspects um, that we're trying to get across from day one, but through to the end, and Simon alluded to it before as well, is the importance of being seen in the industry. Um, uh, Chris Smith from Big, which is a, a foundation company here in Australia, says the number one way to be seen is to volunteer. Mm -hmm. The first time you volunteer in the esports industry, you'll be you'll get known, your name gets known, and then you'll find that offers start coming. Um, so. Uh, Again, going back to that notion, these are 17 to 18, yeah, 17, 18 and 19 year olds who think work, sleep, play, job at McDonald's. Um, so they don't yet have quite fitted in there and volunteer. Um, but hopefully in the last half of the year, the V word will come into place. And then the last part, the last unit is that we, um, and this is the one that's slightly different to when Simon went through, is when I sat and had a look at the entire course, I realised that there was nowhere that we actually took a look at how to um, think about an event. So what does an esports event look like? Now, it doesn't have to be a dream hack event, but just how does an event, what does an event look like? How does it come together? What people are needed for it, aside from the obvious ones? Um, and how do we plan for that? So it actually gives them an, uh, uh, the ability to do some research into um, event management planning in this sense, um, which is not specific to eSport, but, you know, that realisation, unless the students have done um, a subject in high school in Queensland called tourism, they won't know about the aspects behind the requirements of, you know, uh, number of toilets per 100 people or per 1,000 people, um, what you do if there's an emergency, how to have event catering 
happening. Um, what to do if your uh, you know, your your broadcasters don't show uh, and so forth. So it's more about planning the contingencies of an event management than actually planning an event. The uh, one little slide additional to that is that um, we currently have um, a new room being built um, in our college, which is specifically for the more high-end uh, diplomas such as the eSports diploma. So there'll actually be a room um, or this room, I should say, could actually accommodate an event such as an eSports event. So my thoughts here are that in 2024, we may look at slightly um, modifying that assessment task and it would be more of a class-oriented assessment task and have a functioning event occur um, where we can have a look at them pulling an eSports event together, even if it's just a lunchtime um, competition or something, and we assess them on their ability to pull an event together. But um, so this is how we try and grow and and, and um, uh, keep the the course up to date by constantly looking and reviewing and the things that we can do. So that's our course in a long winded, very long, a very large nutshell. Thank you, thank you very much. Do you have a, an additional slide? Otherwise, I come up uh, with all my questions no i'm okay. pretty sure that's the one okay there thanks. we are thank you very much so um i don't know where to start i have so much questions and you did a great job of expanding the program it's called units and i i love how how it seems really holistic and how how i experience you talking about the program with a lot of joy with a lot of um yeah, being proud, talking about it, and it still develops. So it, the course changed from Simon's attendance to the current year. Um, and I don't honestly know where to start with my questions, but I think one question to start with could be, um, so what are the requirements for students to apply? What fees are included if they want to study this course? Can you say something about that? Yes. So um, I'll answer from applying from school because sure. you were post school I was and you've got more experience with that. Um, so applying from school, uh, students who are in year 12 or within the 12 months of finishing year 12 um, get an ATAR. Uh, again, I did some research. I, I don't know that you have an equivalent or what your equivalent system is um, Oliver, but um, as the ATAR is a scoring system that's Australia-wide now. It, it wasn't until a few years ago, but basically students receive a score um, from their studies. It's a big calculation to how that occurs. Um, and uh, to get into our course, uh, they require an ATAR of 60. So most diploma subjects um, are usually ATAR, sorry, most university subjects, I should say, bachelor courses, um, are ATARs of 70 and above. So the ATAR goes to 99. 99, yeah. Um, so if you're, so to put the context in there, if you're going to study to be a doctor or a dentist, you'll, you'll be on the 99. So because this is a diploma, um, the ATAR can be lowered slightly, but that also allows it then to be the bridging course. So typically, um, and I've asked this question of all of my students. Um, so what, what they've said to me is that um, predominantly, because as I said, we've got mostly students who are looking to do a bachelor or some sort of IT eventually, they have said, well, I got an ATAR of 60, 61 or 62, not quite enough to get into the bachelor of game design or the bachelor of IT or the bachelor of whatever. I saw this course advertised, I'm into gaming, I've got the 62, so I meet the 60 requirement, sign me up, I'm good to go. Ah, there's also the big positive that I get the first year of the bachelor taken off. Uh, that's the other big selling point. Um, 
which 12 months ago, I don't know that Simon's group actually had comprehended that. Um, it, there wasn't uh, or there hadn't been a big push from the university to, to actually let you realise this is a dual degree. So when I talk to people, I'm, I always mention the fact that it's a dual degree. The actual specifics, um, the, uh, Australia is a bit of a, a funny place um, for going to university. The only requirement that any degree uh, has is English. So it doesn't matter what you're doing, you have to have studied English and then anything else is a bonus. So to get into the diploma in esports, you don't have to have been in an esports club or a team. You don't have to have done IT or as long as you've done English, you're in. And as long as you've got that 60. But having said that, there's no one in either cohort that didn't have an avid interest in gaming. So obviously gaming is a is a a, a, a number one thing yeah. uh, to have up your sleeve. But uh, post year 12, so yeah. sort of was mature. So mine was a slightly different um, I guess experience in enrolling because I had a bachelor's uh, in education already. Um, and I've been working a few years in that. I didn't have a current ATAR, but having the bachelor's was enough of an equivalent um, amount of experience to be able to get essentially straight into the mm -hmm. course. Um, but yeah, I guess as as Craig pointed out, one of the one of the main reasons why a lot of the students went into the course was for that bridging course. Um, and although I've made use of that opportunity to bridge into that bachelor of business. Um, to add that little bit extra experience to, I guess, my career. Um, I think I was one of one of a few students who really kind of got into the Diploma of Esports for the Diploma of yes. Esports. Um, obviously, everyone had a, a great deal of interest in esports and in gaming, um, but all of a, a lot of them at least had this notion that they would move on and progress into that bachelor. Mm -hmm. Whereas I was still undecided at the time if I would continue. Mm -hmm. But my yeah, my experience in enrolling was pretty pretty easy because I had a graduated bachelor's under my belt. Um, there wasn't really any any issues mm -hmm. in the equivalency. So uh, cost wise, um, I am of the understanding all diplomas are the same. Uh, financial amount. Um, so a diploma at the university is 11,000 around that. Something like that. Something, yeah. It's around the $11,000 mark. Um, and again, from um, not from Simon's perspective, but from um, coming straight from year 12, the way that the system works here for domestic students is that um, uh, the government has what's called a higher education um, HCCS. I can't actually remember yeah. what it stands for, but um, basically the government lends you money to study and then once you start earning a certain amount of, of money in your salary, you then start paying it back. So um, the, the uh, cutoff for that is, is 50000 So once you are on a $50,000 um, salary, then there's a percentage that you have to pay back. So the diploma in esports um, uh, qualifies for that sort of payment. So technically what it means is uh, for any student who's coming on an ATAR, um, who isn't working, doesn't have a full-time job, um, can do, is doing the course effectively free of charge, but at some point, along with any of their other studies, will pay for it. Uh, but that's how the Australian education system works. Yeah. Um, I, and I can't answer for you whether you did you pay mine that up that your, your, So mine's still on my hex bill. Ah, there you go. Which I was still paying off from my bachelor anyway. Yeah. Um, so I just added that on. <laughs> I have a funny feeling that if I studied now, I wouldn't get hex. <laughs> I own too much. Yeah. Thank but, you. Yeah. For explaining that, um, have some important questions left, um, and time is running yes. fast. So you you address some collaborations into the esports environment or ecosystem, such as schools or organizations, including Lego and esport teams. And Simon, one specific question to you: How do you think that those um, connections help you? Um, so 
how did you benefit from those collect uh, connections and how did those connections influence your current career? Oh, massively. Um, I think it was really uh, important that, you know, the teaching team, Craig, Mike, when he was teaching, Mark, um, they all really stressed that connections in what is, especially in Australia, a very young and growing industry, um, the connections are paramount. That's what gets you into the room. That's what gets you opportunities. That's what gets you speaking to the right people and learning from the right people as well. So, Throughout my time completing the diploma and, you know, to this day, I'm constantly reaching out to people, trying to learn from people. Um, I've been then fortunate enough to be able to use some of those responses and some of those learnings and insights that people have given me into their careers as coaches or data analysts for esports teams um, to then share with my students as well um, and give a little bit more of an insight to my students that I don't have because I'm not an esports coach. I'm not a data analyst for an esports team. Um, so I think it's really important to lean on one another in this, this industry and in this growing industry, especially, um, and learn from one another so you can impart that knowledge and really, I guess, be all on that same page. Mm -hmm. I think it's really safe to say as well, um, I once I started working here at QT, um, I'd taken a little bit of a, uh, of a break from LinkedIn, but with LinkedIn being that really important um, working and academic type social media, um, once I started working here, I, I brought that put what my job title was, the number of connections um, just exploded. Like I've got, I have hundreds of them now that, that, you know, 12 months ago I didn't have. But the important aspect of that is then uh, what I've been saying to the students is, um, you know, this, this is a course where maybe other lecturers don't want you to be connected on LinkedIn. I want you to connect with me on LinkedIn because once you're connected there, you've then got access to my connections and links. Um, and from, as a result of that, we've got things like, um, you know, Simon for the last term has been working as an esports teacher mm. directly as a result of connections and finishing the course. Um, Bailey from last year's course uh, is a is a coach in a school and a another organisation. Um, we've got another student who uh, has started working uh, for understandably for for family, but it has the it's with IT, but there's possible aspect of esports in there. In the current cohort of students, two of my students have just um, picked up uh, coaching jobs at one of the, the uh, local girls' private schools. Um, another student just, again, uh, from, from my reaching out to, uh, as an old boy from the high school that I went to, um, and connecting him as an old boy from the same school to the now uh, you know, academic lead at that school and saying, hey, have you thought about esports because I've got a student who would like to walk back in the door as an old boy and get that going. So um, we're just exponentially seeing this grow. Um, it's not in any official capacity, I guess, is a way of putting it, but it's happening. It's there. Um, and we're trying to take advantage of using our connections and social media to get things happening. Thanks. And, and beside those connections, Simon, what, what do you think? How does the diploma in esports at QUT influenced your employability or your um, yeah, current standing in esports? Yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, well, like one point that was really, I guess, honed in on as you're going through those modules, there was that idea that we're really looking, well, the diploma itself is really looking at industry from a very holistic perspective. Uh, you get the opportunity in 001 to look at the various tiers of stakeholders and then jump into that in more depth in 004. Uh, you get to create marketing plans for different endemic and non-endemic um, sponsors. So as much as it feels a little bit like a cop-out answer, I feel like the most value that I got from that was being able to understand the industry quite well on a very broad level. Um, we are not looking in at just coaching. You're not looking in at just psychology. Um, and therefore, especially kind of in the role that I was doing um, in this first term of the year, I was able to, I guess, 
teach all of these different areas that are really key and integral to the esports industry because I got that broad um, exposure to it through the diploma. That's pretty interesting. And and do do you have a, a mumbling? Do you have an advice for students or potential students at QT how to make the best out of their time? Absolutely. I think what I really got out of it was how much that I put into it. So a lot of students, and we mentioned kind of the age being between 17 and 19. Um, and I was back when I started my bachelor's at that age, I was very much the same. I would go to uni, I would do kind of as the bare minimum that I would need to kind of pass and get through because you've got other things on your mind and you want to spend your time in other ways. But I think I was fortunate enough being the mature age student that I didn't have to be there. I already had a job. Um, I already had a career set up. I wasn't necessarily, it wasn't leading towards a career um, that I didn't have. So I was able to really not take it for granted and therefore put myself right into it. So for any students undertaking study like this, Put yourself into it, make those connections on LinkedIn or face-to-face, -face. Um, stay back, ask questions from Craig or whoever, you know, Katrina, whoever might be taking the class. Um, do extra research that's, you know, needed outside of your assessments um, because you really get out of it, I guess, what you put into it. I think that's some great advice. Um, would you like to add something to that, Greg? Um, I think... As I said earlier, uh, for me, uh, yes, you're, Oliver, you identified. Um, I'm very passionate about this course and, and very excited and uh, was um, very honoured to be brought on board with the course. Um, but I think because I have that value and uh, prior to being uh, working at QUT, I was a high school teacher and I've, so I've always enjoyed teaching, always really wanted my students to do well. Um, you know, if, if for me to this course is successful if I've got those students interested. So it, it's about keeping it interested. And I think because of the the nature of the topic, um, we've still got a few years yet before uh, we run out of newness um, in esports. So it's going to be very easy, hopefully, to just keep the enthusiasm going with the students and just you know. Um, encouraging them and showing things that, that they might not have thought about that they can get into. Yeah, absolutely agree. And I only can stress that I love the idea of continuing to develop the program to to adapt it to the constantly changing environment of esports. So my last question to both of you, um, I'd say Greg can start and then we, we continue with Simon. What is it that you most enjoy about the program? Sorry, I think we're losing you again, Oliver. Oh. Is it better now? Yeah. Is it better? Hmm. Maybe we have to wait a second. I'm sorry about that. Can you hear me? Oh. Can you hear me now, Greg? Simon? Okay. Great. Seems like. So my last question, I'm sorry about the connection, um, is what do you think is most enjoyable or what do you enjoy the most about the program and the course? Maybe we can start with Simon. Yeah. Um, I think it was really interesting doing a course that is so new in the fact that the course is new, but so new in the fact that esports and what you're studying is new. Um, as I said, like my background was I completed a bachelor in education. Um, and even within that, obviously you're talking psychological principles and educational principles that have been around for ages and the course may not have been updated in the last five years, five, 10, 15 years, whatever it may be. But because esports is so new, the course had to be dynamic. There was new things that Craig was bringing in every week. 
that was like, this has happened quite literally within the last three days. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of marketing opportunities that occurred in Australia for the Chiefs and with L'Oreal um, were occurring as we were studying mm -hmm. it and as we were talking about those specific things. So I think the way that it is very, I guess, relative to what we're going through as people who either enjoy playing games or enjoy watching esports competitions, um, but also the way that we could see that it was such a new and emerging industry, especially within Australia, that we could really, I guess, see ourselves within that industry, um, not only working for it, but helping to shape and direct it. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that was very exciting and a very interesting component to the diploma itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I believe by by getting insights to all of the different aspects that the core units address, uh, you might find some opportunities for jobs as well. Um, and Greg, what do you enjoy the most? It, it, the thing that I enjoy the most is um, is actually being able to work at this level uh, um, with this age student. Um, it's different to working in secondary, but also um, working uh, in curriculum development. It's something that I've always enjoyed doing. Um, so having the opportunity to, to look at the curriculum of, of a really still quite fresh area and um, really think about what's the best way to present this to students, uh, what's a, a real-world application of an assessment task, um, and then the weekly, uh, my, my weekly research in, in ensuring that what I'm telling the students is still fresh today from a change yesterday. Um, I, I still enjoy that. Um, always have enjoyed learning and, and being able to pass that on. So, um, yeah, that really makes the job exciting. Yeah, I, I believe that. Thank you very much. Um, these were all my questions for now. The time's over, I'd say. Is there something you would like to add before I close the session? Oh, just appreciate being able to share with you, Oliver, yeah. and, and anybody else who is um, in and listening um, on our exciting journey that we've had. And, um, you know, we'd love to come back and share with you again and maybe in 12 months' time and let you know how it's going with a new cohort of students coming through and, and Simon having worked with me as both student level and tutorial uh, on tutorials. Mate, you're, you're always welcome, and I really appreciate you joining today. Um, thanks to everyone listening. Thanks to everyone watching the recording. This was the session. Um, yeah, I'm really happy how it turned out. It was great listening to both of you. And um, I will link the course in the chat, uh, in the description of the video, and also your uh, contacts in the description. So thank you very much and goodbye.